Hello everyone! For the video that we will have today, we'll tackle Egyptian art, particularly the statue of Ramses II and make connections to the poem Ozymandias by Percy Bichelli. I am your facilitator, Kathleen C. Adahar, and I've been teaching literature for almost 30 years now. And for this video, aside from talking about the poem, Ozymandias, we will also relate it to contemporary issues and always reflect how we can connect ourselves to the poem. When we say Egyptian art, probably the first thing that comes to our mind would be the pyramid. The beginning of the pyramid was rooted in the belief of the Egyptians in the afterlife. So the pharaoh, during his reign, ordered his servants, his slaves, to create a tomb for him because they have this belief that there is life after death. So the early tomb of the Egyptians was called the Mastaba. So it was just very simple, just like a house probably. You have the post and lintel construction. However, there was one pharaoh who wanted something grander than a mere Mastaba. So he ordered his architect to design something grander. So his architect had this idea of why not uh, forming one Mastaba over the other. The result was the pyramid. So we have the pyramids at Giza, the largest owned by King Cheops or Pharaoh Cheops. It's 475 feet high. It's 738 feet wide. It took 20 years to build and it's made of limestone. So it's the final resting place of the Pharaoh. And also we can remember or recall the great Sphinx at Giza with Pharaoh Khafre with the body of a lion. Aside from the pyramids, one requirement would be the statues for the tombs. So it would depict the Pharaoh to be sitting, one hand on his knee, and the men with darker skin than women. And yes, it's a requirement that every tomb should have a statue. Why? Because uh, they have this belief that in case the mummified body would be destroyed, there is a place for the soul to transfer or to live, which is the statue. That's why it should be depicted as young and healthy looking. So, this is one example where you have the woman, okay, uh, which is um, having lighter skin th or lighter skin color than men. This is one example of a colossal statue. I got this photo from the National Geographic magazine. So, issue April 1991. So this is the great Ramses II at the British Museum. So when it was brought to the British Museum. So you see the contrast, the people looking at it look small in contrast to the huge statue. These are other photos from the same magazine in National Geographic, still owned by Ramses II. I also got this photo from the same magazine. It is said that Ramses died at around 90 years old, but his mummified body evaded destruction for 3,000 years. Embalmers spent 70 days preparing the corpse. So, you see that after 3,000 years, the body is still intact. That's because of mummification. You might also recall the film... The Ten Commandments. So I'm going to show you a short clip of that film, just for us to to feel uh, to feel the, the role uh, of Ramses. Sacred water, make pure the flood, 
from which you came. Now, we have the poem Ozymandias written by Percy Bysshe Shelley. So, it was done in 1818 and documents would tell us that Shelley composed it soon after the British Museum acquired a large fragment of a statue of Ramses II from the 13th century BC. So, the name Ozymandias is the same as Ramses II. So, if you look at Egyptian history, there are many Ramseses, but it is said that it was Ramses II who was also called Ozymandias and the same pharaoh during the time of Moses. And you might also uh, be familiar with Shelley um, as you have heard Mary Shelley. So Mary Shelley was his wife and Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein. Let's take a look at the poem. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shuttered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them, and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. When I discuss this poem to my students, the first thing I would do is um, let them pretend to be the traveler. So if you take a look at the first line, I met a traveler. So you have the persona I, okay? And this persona met a traveler. And this traveler was the one narrating to the persona what he saw from the antique land. So this antique land here, when we say antique, it's old or ancient so that actually refers to egypt okay so this traveler was from egypt and he was telling the persona what he saw okay so uh, when i discuss this to my students i i tell them first to imagine what they have read so an initial activity that i would um, ask them to do would be draw what you saw from the antique land if you were the traveler Make it accurate and complete. Pay attention to the details described by Shelley. Because for me, w when you have a poem, you have to visualize what you are reading. So what did you see? Or what do you see? If you, if you are the traveler, what do you see? So you may start your drawing if you like. And... Afterwards, I will ask my student, what was seen by the traveler in the antique land? And the second question, what does the word them refer to in line 3? Okay? So, what was seen by the traveler? So, you have in line 2, two vast and trunkless legs of stone. So, what did he see? He saw legs, but these legs are trunkless. When we say trunkless, you don't have the, the body anymore, only the legs, just like uh, the trunk of a tree, right? So when you say trunkless legs, only the legs are standing. And these legs are made of stone and they are big, as shown in the words, two vast and trunkless legs of stone. And they are standing in the desert. Okay, so you see a statue, but it's trunkless. Only the legs are standing in the desert. Near them, so line 3, the, the word them, the pronoun them here refers to the legs. So meaning near the legs on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies. So visage is a face, okay? So, but it is shattered. So you see the entire statue is ruined already. The body is not there, only the legs are standing. And near the legs, you have the visage. And what is in the visage or in the face? Is it smiling? Or what? 
So lines 4 and 5 would tell us the, the facial expression found in the statue or in the visage. Whose frown, so it's frowning. And wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command. So you have in line 5, cold command. So we, we already know that Ozymandias is the, the pharaoh, Ramses II. So with this, when he gives command, what is your impression? It's cold command. So in literature, particularly in poetry, we have this thing called connotation. So what can be the connotation of the word cold? So just like in a relationship, when you are cold with one another, meaning there's no warmth in your love, right? So cold command. So what can be the connotations here? So probably uh, he was a dictator. When he would give command, he was authoritative. So those synonyms, okay? And line 6 would tell us something about the maker of the statue. Tell that its sculptor, well, those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things. So lifeless things here would refer to the entire statue. But things, because they are now in fragments, okay? So when the sculptor made the statue, the the true personality of Ozymandias was stamped or let's say was sealed okay so in in tagalog or in filipino stamped would be tatak na tatak na tatak sa mga bagay okay so stamped on these lifeless things so the the real personality of Ozymandias is found in that statue the hand that mocked them. Here, the hand here would refer to the hand of the, the sculptor, the one making, making the statue. And when he made it, it's like in a mocking way. That, that's also possible. Alright? Because he, he saw the true personality of Azimandia. So, he was just truthful to what he saw in real life. And he depicted that in the statue that he made. The heart that fed here, the heart refers to the heart of, of the pharaoh, okay? So, um, the pharaoh contributed to the making of the statue because it was his true personality that is depicted in the sculpture, okay? And aside from that, aside from the legs that we see, aside from the visage that is shattered, we also see pedestal, alright? Line 9. And on the pedestal, these words appear. So what's written on the pedestal? So pedestal is like the base in, in a statue. Okay? So that's what's written. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. So we'll take a look at those lines later on. First, I'm going to show you the drawing done by a previous student. Yes, that's it. Uh, this was made uh, during the time when there was not much information yet from the internet. So, the name of the student is Ray and his family name is Leo from the computer studies. And he made this one personally. He didn't copy from someone else. And I, I kept uh, this drawing because for me, that's the best representation of the poem. And very artistic. All right. So let's proceed. So for the third question that I formulated, yeah, we have discussed that earlier. How did the sculptor depict Ozymandias in the statue that he made? So he depicted it as realistically as possible. So he was able to get the true personality of Ozymandias or Ramses II and depicted that in the statue. Number four, how did Ozymandia see or perceive himself? Why do you think so? All right, so if you look at lines 10 and 11, it's like these are the words of Ozymandias. He, claim, he claimed to be king of kings. And just imagine that. If you're also a king from a different kingdom and you happen to pass by his territory and you're able to read those lines, what would be your feeling? 
yeah, th this person is claiming to be mightier than you, and you pale in comparison against this king, against this pharaoh, because he claims to be king of kings. So, what would be your perception of him? You might say, this man, this pharaoh is very boastful. Why is he claiming to be mightier than me? All right? So, that can be the impression of people. So, how did Ozymandias see or perceive himself? Probably he perceived himself to be the mightiest of all. Right? And if you just look at your work compared to what he has achieved, you'll be in despair because you really pale in comparison. So, that can be the perception of Ozymandias about himself. So, let's now continue. So, that's what you see in the inscription in the pedestal. However, lines 12, 13, and 14 would tell us the opposite. Right? So, we expect that we would see his kingdom. We would see his properties, his creations. However, in line 12, you have nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sand stretch far away. So what figure of speech is found there? It's an example of irony. Expectation versus result. So you expect that you would see his works because he claims to have works. Look on my works. However, there's nothing left. And you have very powerful words here. Colossal wreck. You have the k sound. Okay? What is that sound device? Oh, find it out. What is that sound device? Colossal wreck. Boundless and bare. So, b sound. Right? Boundless and bare. That can be alliteration. And you also have the last line. Line 14. Lone level. Right? It can be alliter another alliteration. And you have sans stretch. Oh, what are those sound devices? So you see, um, Shelley is very clever in choosing the right words. Okay, so we then ask ourselves, so what about this poem? H how can we relate in the present time? Because Ozymandias lived a long time ago. So we now go into the message of Shelley. W what is he trying to tell us here? Okay. So, yes, we have uh, answered those questions. What do the last two lines imply? What is the message of Shelley in this poem? What is the relevance of this poem to us? So, 6, 7, and 8 are all, are all interrelated. Okay? So, if we reflect about it today and the message of the poem, it's telling us that nothing lasts forever. There was one pharaoh who claimed to be the king of kings. But where are, where are his works now? You cannot see them anymore. So, in poetry, we then go back to ourselves. We make connections. Okay? Then we're able to reflect that in our lives, probably we, we crave for power or we boast to people that we own this, I have this latest gadget, I have these achievements. There is nothing wrong with being proud of what you have achieved. However, I believe that there can be limits to it. So what are those limits? When, uh, let us say, we think so highly of ourselves and we maltreat people who are less educated or who are less fortunate, I think, that's where our flaw will be, right? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with achieving things, but we have to realize that there is an end to it or um, nothing is permanent, okay? Soon, we'll be gone in this world. And I'm going to share an essay written by Father Miguel Bernard of the Society of Jesus, and he titled it, A Shattered Visage. So, he was talking about the bust of President Ferdinand Marcos, created in 1978 to 1980. It's 98 feet high, okay, in Pugo, La Union, Philippines, but it was destroyed in 2002. 
There is a well-known poem by Shelley about a once colossal statue that was in ruins in the desert. Standing on the pedestal were the two huge legs, but the rest of the body was gone. Nearby, half buried in the sand, was the shattered visage, the remnant of the once colossal face. There was enough, however, to indicate that it had been the face of a ruthless and all-powerful monarch whose every wish was law. On the pedestal was the inscription, My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. That poem came to mind the other day when I read of Marcus's huge bust having been blown up by dynamite. It had indeed been colossal, 30 meters or 90 feet high, probably the largest representation of a human face in the world. When that huge statue was erected, doubtless at enormous cost, it was probably intended to last forever. It was to be a perpetual memorial to Ferdinand Marcus's greatness. Its hugeness would protect it from any petty attempts to destroy it, and the reinforced concrete of which it was made would withstand the strongest storms or earthquakes. Alas! They did not foresee what dynamite could do. That shattered face in the Ilocos countryside is a symbol of how impermanent human greatness is. Marcos didn't have the name of king, but he was as powerful as any absolute monarch. His word was law, and he believed in pomp and splendor. He had a large throne installed in Malacanang. And in receiving the credentials of foreign ambassadors, Marcus stood in front of the throne as if he were indeed a king. The visiting ambassador would approach from the other end of the room and make several bows as they approached. I don't remember now whether it was a triple bow. It was faintly reminiscent of the oriental splendor and pomp of the popes before Vatican II when the visitor would approach and make a triple genuflection before kneeling to kiss the papal feet. All that pomp and splendor is gone, and the shattered image in the Ilocos countryside is a symbol of its disappearance. Okay. So, Father Bernard was able to relate the poem to an issue in Philippine history. So for me, I believe that that's what we also do when we analyze poetry or any literary pieces. We always make connections, okay? So in our own lives, how can we relate to the poem Ozymandias? So we think, have we been also very boastful? Okay, so what can be the effect of that? Okay? So I want you to think, what can be our insights about this? Uh, perhaps we are acquiring so many things. We, we demand from our parents the latest gadget, the latest model of this gadget, just for us to be famous. Okay? So what are some other instances? So you can write about it and uh, we make a reflection paper. So write a short reflection essay in relation to the message of the poem Ozymandias by Percy Bichelli. Because I believe that uh, when we have a literary piece, we will always find connections between it and our lives. So thank you very much for uh, joining me in this video. And I hope to um, have you also in the other videos that I'm going to upload. Thank you very much once again.